Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with your co-host, the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and his wife, Jeannie. Michael and Jeannie share with you the wisdom of the ancient Aramaic internal process of forgiveness. They offer tools and support five days a week. They will support you in building a solid foundation within yourself to live in pure love. In Aramaic, Rachma. Michael is the author of Why Is This Happening to Me Again? For more information on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. And now your co-host, The Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael and Jeannie Rice. To the brightness within you and the truth that Hi, and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice. The previous show was just a tiny bit over, so we're a little bit late getting started. Our call line number is 646-200-4169. Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. We do already have a caller with their hand up. But first, let's welcome Michael and Dr. Tim. Hello, Dr. Tim. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, but I have my mute button on. Can't quite hear you, Kim. Are you there? I'm here. Are you there? I think I'm here. <laughs> awesome. Good, good afternoon. How are things in Chicago? Well, things are going beautifully. It's a Friday, and I'm hoping we're going to hear Dale Allen Hoffman today. That's we the plan. Have, we have Dale on the phone with us already. Yeah, awesome. I'm here. We've got people just hanging on, just waiting for you to show up. That sounds good. Yeah, it is good. It is good. <laughs> yeah, the you are last, appreciated. The last two shows have been fabulous, and I'm looking forward to another one. Well, thank you. We never know what's going to happen, but that's a good thing. So <laughs> we're open. I think that's the Aramaic way, isn't it? Yeah, it needs – you know, it really uh, – it's amazing. I mean, we've we've got so many – this relationship with these, you know, quote-unquote Jesus teachings, we have this – conceptual relationship with them when they were never meant to be something that you understand with your mind. They were meant to be lived and something that comes through you through your openness. And it's almost exactly the opposite of what we've been taught in so many ways. So it really is the Aramaic way, I would say. Yeah, there's no, there's no money in uh, not being somebody's authority, but letting them live it and or supporting them and living it and uh, being their own authority. There's there's just no money. There's no power. There's no control. You can't, you know, control people's political vote, their bank account, their genitals. You know, all kinds of things disappear <laughs> when you make it what it was originally designed to be. Yeah. <laughs> Well, one of the things we talked about last Friday was looking into the Aramaic Beatitudes, and uh, I suspect that Dr. Kim has probably got uh, some of the uh, the Beatitude uh, translations from the fellow who did the um, the book Way of Mastery. I suspect you'll probably have those in hand to uh, to give us some input as well. And I'll just start out with the with kind of an introduction to the Beatitudes and my experience of them. Uh, you know, for those who may not know it, I'm the director of a foundation that's translating a copy of the oldest known New Testament in Aramaic in its original language into English. And I can remember in the early days when I was working with this, I sat down longhand. We we published a book called Enlightenment, and in that there's a first century dictionary in the back of it. And I can remember the first time that I sat down and translated longhand the Beatitudes. Work is that it's a it's a powerful exercise, and it wasn't you know I was always taught you know this the attitudes it's a nice you know blessed are they it's a nice philosophy isn't that cute, um, but you know where was the practical application, and I can remember the, the light going on in the the bells and whistles went off in my head, the third time I wrote it out longhand and went oh my god this is a set of instructions. This is a how-to. This isn't a nice philosophy. This is how you do it. And uh, that first word, and I'll, I'll invite uh, uh, you, Dale, to, to give us some, some input on the word tuve and uh, we'll see what uh, 
Tim might have to offer if he's got anything from the fellow that did the way of mastery. But that word tuvehum, which has been translated as blessed are they, and you know, this has got to be a pretty important word. This is Yeshua's first public teaching, and he uses the word over and over and over again. And there is no logical way to translate that word as some sort of an external blessing is going to be bestowed on you by somebody who approves of you and wants to control you if you do this. And so the, the word tuvehun is a three-part word, and it speaks of a, a possessive, and it speaks of an unconscious condition in the mind, the only language I know on the planet that suffixes and prefixes tell you whether something is conscious or unconscious and whether it's controlling perceptions, decisions, and behavior. And so this word tuvehum speaks of a latent or an unconscious neural structure that was originally implanted in us as human beings to guide us to happiness and well-being. And the living of the Beatitudes is a set of instructions for how to activate that neural structure. So it, it, overall, each Beatitude would start out with, from the perspective of the Kaburis, a latent neural structure implanted by the Creator to guide you to happiness and well-being becomes your conscious possession, you who, and then the Beatitudes are the instructions. So we'll get into the instructions in a few minutes, but Dale, I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on that. And... Uh, and then perhaps Dr. Kim will have some input for us. Oh, absolutely. Um, we keep saying the way of mastery. Are we talking about J.M.? Is that who we're uh, – way of mastery? He, he's like uh, J.M.'s – yeah, yeah, yeah. he's uh, such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful soul. Uh, just thinking about him, my, my, my heart lights up. So, um, have, you, have you heard his – Oh yeah, I've got a, I've got quite a few of his CDs, DVDs. What JM does though, he's not a translator. He he re, he kind of takes the best of what resonates for him from Rocco Erico and Neil Douglas Klotz and then you know, brings it through his yogic understanding, you know, from a, a very experiential perspective and then kind of uh sort of puts it back out there. But he's got that beautiful pure heart to be able to do that and I absolutely adore uh I adore his work. I really do. Yeah, he's got such a, a beautiful gentle presence. But um well Tuve Hoon Hoon I, I like starting backwards with the word because the 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 big sort of meat of it is sort of in the in the beginning, or should I say tofu as a vegetarian. But um <clears throat> hoon, you know, hoon at the end means uh if you ever hear hoon at the end of a word in Aramaic, it means something that you that's a con literally what you actually said michael was a conscious something that you are in conscious possession of or something that uh and it means plural in this case if it was kun as in a k and this is language i don't want to go too deep into the linguistics but if it was tuve kun which one of the final beatitudes is actually of the last three uh kun is him talking to one person hun is him talking to several people at once saying this is something that becomes that is your conscious possession, literally, hoon. Um, that EY sound is the same as the ta sound that we've talked about the last couple of weeks, which connotates the feminine, which literally means it's it's perception, it's state of being. It's something that's uh, – the masculine would be something physical that you can look at and say there it is, but feminine would be something that is something that's happening through you, something within a state of being or an attitude, you could say, and tuv is such a beautiful, rich word that uh, in the o Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, the Torah, uh, in Genesis, every time Elohim would create something, he would say, and it was, and the, what we have is good from the King James. Now, that word good uh, comes from the Anglo-Saxon Germanic gud, G-U with two dots on, on top and a D. And the funny thing is there's not a word in Aramaic or in Hebrew that means good. Uh, what that word, one a deeper meaning of that could mean goodness. And the way I explain that to people is there's a difference between good and goodness. Good is a judgment of this is good. And immediately your, your brain being a binary system is immediately going to think, okay, if this is good, then obviously something somewhere is bad. And it wasn't that Elohim was saying this is good. He was saying, and this is, and it was tuv. Tuv uh, in Hebrew and Aramaic, what it actually means is ripe. It means R I P E. You spoke of uh, from enlightenment the the 
neural structures that become your conscious possession when they are active. And ripeness, literally, if two could be soil, such as dark, rich earth that uh, is fertile and rich and it's ready for planting, such as when Yeshua said uh, in the New Testament where it says that he spoke of a seed that goes into two of earth or rich, fertile earth as opposed to arid earth. And one of the things that, I, that I'll often ask is I'll say, when, if we're speaking of ripeness, R-I-P-E, like a piece of fruit, when's the only moment in time that you can actually judge a piece of fruit as being ripe? And people will be like, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. And it's like, when does that happen? They're like, well, when I bite into it. And I'm like, ah, when you bite into it, when you smell it, when the juice is running down your chin. Tuv in Aramaic and Hebrew means now. It means absolute being 100% fertile and conscious right now. So God wasn't saying it was good and something else is bad. It was that Elohim said, for this moment right now, it's conscious and it's ripe and it's fertile. And what a deep, 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 rich understanding. And it was also a word in, in archery when someone would actually hit the bullseye right in the center of that target, the scorekeeper would yell out, Tuv, meaning that you nailed it. You are right in the perfect place for right now. You got it right here and right now. And uh, wow, what a deep richness. That's one of the words that when I tell people, you know, Tuve Hoon is one of those things that, man, it's a real challenge to get into English because there's just, with those, th just the three sounds alone, but Tuve especially, um, it's a real, it's a real challenge because it's a frame of reference that us, you know, from an English culture, we don't really have deep roots in. It wasn't really put there in our language, so we have to kind of dance around it and talk about it in all these different ways and sort of point back at it. But the way to truly understand it is when I tell people, you know, when we speak of heaven, holding that baby in the first 20 minutes of life, or you're hiking through the woods and you're very conscious and you're paying attention to your breath, and all of a sudden you're lit up and you realize, hey, I'm connected with everything and the water in the stream feels like it's in your heart and you can smell the blossoms from the other side of the stream and you're just, there's almost like this beauty infusing through your being. That's Tuv. And when Yeshua was saying this, he wasn't talking about a blessing that's bestowed upon you. He's talking about literally you are lit up, you're fertile, you're ripe, you're rich right now in this present moment. And that that was something that literally was – a channel or a gateway that was put into us naturally by the creator. And that's actually our natural state of being. And that's of course what we throw all the bushel back baskets on top of and choke out in our life at a pretty young age. Usually. A, uh, a good uh, piece for me in, in understanding that, uh, that particular idea also was that, um, and it's more Hebrew, I'm not sure how it fits in the Aramaic, but was that it meant in its proper place, in its proper time. So as the Creator said it was good, it's like, and this is right on target, as everything in our lives is absolutely and all the time in its proper place and in its proper time. That's where uh, I think the idea comes from Yeshua. You don't need to pray for anything. You don't need to ask. You don't need to put an order into the cosmic gift catalog. Stop that. The Creator already gave you what is two. Michael, you mean the most terrible event in my life that just happened? That's perfect? Well, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to become whole and fully expressed and healed, yes, you're going to have arrive in your life through a law called the law of resonance, exactly what you need to look at next, exactly what you need to deal with next, and therefore it is too. It is in its proper place and in its proper time. Mm, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Exciting stuff. So, Dale, say more about uh, your understanding of the um, the idea of it being a latent neural structure. Well, um, it's dynamic. One thing that's interesting about the ta and the ey sounds are that um, when you look at in language, something like heaven, a word like heaven. Um, a word like uh, in Tuve Hun, the EY, the A sound, is the same meaning as the TA sound. And what that actually means is this is something that is your natural – it's actually your natural state of being. The way I liken it is you've got a pipeline or a natural channel sort of running through your system 
that we tend to block off. When we pull those blocks out, that's when heaven and that blessed state of rightness is able to awaken. And that's actually how we're meant to be. That's actually – and Yeshua said that. Look, he said it very clearly to the disciples at one place in, in the New Testament where he says – they're like, why do you always speak to us in parables? And I think people read that thinking uh, like he was inside of a house and there was people waiting outside of a house, but there's no mention of a house in this phrase. He goes on to say to those out – he says to you, uh, it's given to you to understand the kingdom, to experience the kingdom. To those outside, everything must be in parables lest they not understand. Or if you look at it in Aramaic, it literally says to anyone outside – that I have to speak in parables because everything is coded when it when your his implication in the Aramaic is outside of the kingdom, not meaning outside of any kind of a house that it looks like if you're looking at it in the King James. So he's saying that if you're not in that blessed state of rightness, if Tuve Hun is not going and sort of firing on, on our all cylinders for you, you're outside the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom's not active through you, and he speaks in parables because unless someone's actually in that state of being, they're not really going to be able to pick up what he was trying to communicate. And parables are brilliant too because you can send them through multiple uh, languages, and they kind of maintain their basic integrity of meaning, whereas if he were to give a really clear stagnant te- – I don't know what stagnant is not the word, but – a very clear step-by-step teaching like the Beatitudes that were not necessarily coded. They were actually very clear in Aramaic. You put those through different languages, and the meaning just gets completely lost and made into theological promises is kind of what I call them, what they are today. Yeah, it also ties in. It also ties in, I think, Dale, with uh, with Yeshua's words where he says you've got to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Those who having eyes do not see are those who are outside of the understanding, who don't have the brain cells. And yeah. as you build brain cells, and, and you know, when he talks about the uh, the idea that uh, the things I do, you too can do in greater, he's saying if you've got the brain cells, if you've digested me, and it's one of my favorite Aramaic parables is is the one where we hear him saying, you've got to eat my body and drink my blood, and people thinking that means, oh, we've got to do communion. You know, it's about wine and a wafer, when what he was saying is, a, is an idiom. It didn't have to do with drinking blood or wine, and it didn't have to do with eating wafers, it was you've got to totally digest, you've got to totally comprehend and build the brains for cells for everything I know, then you'll be able to do what I do. Otherwise, you are outside that community of love in the in the Aramaic, the, the kingdom of heaven being the community of love, and we're designed to live within that community of love, and with that comes the perfection, comes that contact with everything, and you automatically have the brain cells. And again, he says in another place, you know, if you get called before the judge, don't worry about it. If you're connected, you'll be told what to say and what to do. That's the, the two. That's the, the perfection of it. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what's awesome? That the word blood in Aramaic, dama or dama, uh, it means blood, juice, wine, sap, or essence. It means essence. Now, it's also the root of the word Adam, Adam, which means essence or red earth. It literally means from the red earth, red clay, or from the essence of – we were told we were made in the image or likeness of Elohim or Allah. And if you look at that word in the Semitic languages, the word Adam literally means that Adam is the essence of of the one and the only and the all. And it's when we're in our true essence, the Tuve Hun and all of the different phrases that are here uh, or the different terms in the Beatitudes, like we have Malkuta, Kenuta, when that Ta is present and active, especially Tuv A Hun, A, of course, the same as Ta, that's actually, that's the essence of who we actually are. And we, of course, put, as I already said, we put those bushels on top of that light. And it's not that we have to convince ourselves or put more into the system. We've got to take all the junk out, which is, of course, forgiveness and of course we've lost that meaning in so many ways unless we look at it in the original aramaic and uh man i mean it's awesome the beatitudes are literally a step-by-step process it start especially the first seven the first seven are a specific step-by-step process do this you get that the second one builds on the first the third builds on the second and the first the fourth on the third the second and the first uh and it's crystal clear in aramaic whereas you know we've got these sort of coded things today that are those promises that don't quite 
match up to what he was talking about. Well, not at all. It's a whole different ball game. So, Dr. Tim, do you have any other shades to add in from the work you've been doing with? Um... Well, it's... I'll, I'll just read to you what what came off of the DVD from Yam. The Beatitude one from the King James Version is said to read, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the new translation offered by Yam is... Now is the ripe time, R-I-P-E. Now is the ripe time to make your home in the breathing unity. The fertile soil of the queendom will birth your clear guidance. Hmm. Make your home in the breathing unity. Is this uh, recovering, what is it, recovering the breathtaking teachings of Jesus, the DVD? I've got that, where he's in... uh... Is it Israel, maybe Jerusalem or something? Yeah, this is the, the Beatitudes DVD from here. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful – someone alerted me to that sort of about four years ago, which is when I first heard about him. That's actually – that translation is actually Neil Douglas Klotz's translation that he kind of put a different bit of a shade on. And, uh, man, isn't it awesome? People here – I've shared that DVD with so many people over the years, and J.M. has this ability of really – cutting through the crap, you know what I mean? Well, and he and brings also, it through. He has such a pure, soft heart that he can communicate it uh, in a way that's just so beautiful. Well, you and can also, feel it. Also, Dale, he sticks to what you're talking about, which is just do it. Make it a practice. Mm. Don't get stuck in your head. Come back to the breathing and experience it differently. Mm. You know, he the thing that's brilliant about his work also is that he he had that spiritual base before the Aramaic came into his lap. So he was he had the eyes that see and he had the ears that hear. And um yeah, it it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Yeah, and Queendom of course would be that word, uh the word Malkuta, um which of course is that word translated as kingdom and the ta genders it feminine. Hmm, little guy thing going on there. Men always had to trans- retranslate everything. If it was gendered feminine, they would usually gender it. They would regender it neutral. But in the case of Malkuta, they took it all the way from feminine, uh, Malku, which was actually the, the the feminine essence, the goddess energy of creation, and swung it completely in the opposite direction into that kingdom, which is a physical thing. And if we remember that, the kingdom's not a physical place that you can find. It's something that's feminine. It's actually an essence. It's the natural essence of your being. It's the baby in the first 20 minutes of life. And that's what that queendom that he's speaking of is. It's something that's the shining essence coming through instead of any kind of location, whether it be in the clouds or wherever anybody would think that the kingdom is or something that's coming at us. Funny, they said uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, they had said, can you tell us when... First they said, can you tell us how our end will come? And he's like, uh, have you actually found the beginning that now you're looking for the end? Blessed are those who take their place in the beginning, for they will know the end and they will not taste death. And then he all, they also said, can you tell us when the kingdom will come? He says, what you seek has already happened, but you do not comprehend it. He said the kingdom came. He said 2,000 years ago the kingdom was already here, but they couldn't comprehend what he was trying to communicate to them. And still here today we've got people waiting for this kingdom coming at us when it was actually the essence of who we are waking up it's that's our natural birthright that's the tuve hun that was giving to given to us literally even before we were physically created and uh, it's great to hear his teachings again because um i haven't watched that dvd in a while i'll have to break it back out <laughs> and looking at the um the idea of this Queendom is going to be really hard to keep women out of the church and keep them from speaking up or oh, yeah. having it in their own minds. If you teach them it was the queendom, <laughs> that you know. And, and of course, when you look at the creation, where is there? And, and it's it's pretty easy to see the prejudice of the slant. Where is there in the creation that you get anything without a male and a female, with only a male? Mm. It's like never happened, <laughs> and and yet people want to put. 
you know, make this male figure in the sky, which is just the uh, the prejudice of the male who's feeling weak and inferior because, in fact, you know, the truth is he is. If you look at over the uh, the uh, years of, of so-called education in this world and the, uh, the dynamics, the testing and all of that, women always come up on the superior side of it. <laughs> and that's... Um, <laughs> It's not something that we guys want to admit very easily or very often, but that's the truth of it. So let's change the kingdom, and maybe we can keep them locked down and uh, and under control. And give it a physical location. It's funny that Yeshua was there in front of Pilate, Pilatos in the Aramaic, and he, Yeshua, he, Pilate's like, where's this supposed kingdom that you're a king of, that you're a master of? And he's like, well, literally in Aramaic, he says, my kingdom is not from any place that you can see. It is not literally in Aramaic. It is not located in time and space. No, my kingdom is outside of time and space. Otherwise, my handlers would have moved me away from you so that you could do me no harm. And isn't that amazing? He's saying, look, you're not going to find it. It's actually something that's outside of the whole frame of reference that you have. If you don't have the eyes that see and the ears that hear, you're looking for a physical answer. You're looking for something here when it's actually the essence of the physical. It's that. It's the animating spirit, the light behind everything. It's who you are. That's it, what St. Francis said. What, what you are looking for is what is looking. That What you seek is actually that which is seeking through you, which gets me thinking about Brother Sun, Sister Moon again. Such a uh, phenomenal film uh, about the life of St. Francis, who was someone who dropped the concepts and he lived it. He literally lived it. It's just such an, uh, an amazing, inspirational film. And, of course, you turned me on to that back in, had to be about 1995 or so. <laughs> Beautiful. Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it, Dale? Yeah, I mean, I keep thinking about that, and it's like, wow, it's 17 years just since that. So, <sighs> the um, the Kabor's manuscript renders that first uh, beatitude is, and and you can, this is one of the places where you can see the primacy of the Aramaic over the Greek because when you take the word home in Aramaic and you add a fly speck to it, you now have the word poor. And so here's a man who says, I. I come to connect you with the spirit of truth, and now somebody wants us to believe that we're supposed to be poor in spirit. And the word was home, and it was the eternal forces. So those whose home is in the eternal forces from the creator, when we're in touch with those finer essences, rather than five physical senses, our home, our resident place, the thing that gives us instruction is the eternal forces coming from God. That's the two big ones. Instead of what's been stored in our minds from the past and forced into us by the authorities of the world that want to control us. And, you know, they said there'll come a time when the whole world would be fooled, and we're pretty much there. <laughs> We've been there for a while, I think. <laughs> so, do you have any, have any other shades, uh, Dale, for that first beatitude? Well, one thing I would say is um, that word, when you take it from miskin poor to maskin, that word home. Uh, what's interesting about uh, miskin, miskin clearly means poor, but when you put that phonetic sound that, that puts the ah sound in there, it means home, and there's something interesting about that word home. It's one of the words for sanctuary, but it also means empty. Now, think about something like that. Um, like I'm trying to communicate with people, with one vowel sound, it means poor, as in lacking something, and that word that means home also means empty, and if you look at that coming, he's literally talking about a home in emptiness, literally saying, if you do nothing other than literally just pay attention to your breathing and keep your breath moving and pay attention to spirit and keep your attention on spirit and ruka, those eternal forces, without any kind of a goal, the emptiness uh, meaning that you're going in completely open, completely wide open, completely empty. It says, Paul said in Philippians 2, seven that Yeshua emptied himself out and became nothing, napak sarek, completely empty. And when I tell people, they're like, well, what do you mean by empty? I say, literally, pay attention to your breath. Pay attention to those forces moving through you, ruka, 
And they're like, yeah, but how do I do that? I'm like, okay, are you breathing right now? Pay attention to that. They're like, yeah, but do I do a mantra? No. Is there like some sort of a specific technique? Yeah, the technique is pay attention to your breath. Oh, well, I don't know if I can do that. And I'm like, well, that's actually the first beatitude. And the emptiness aspect of it is you're not doing it to create something. You're literally doing it to connect into that natural flow that's coming through you and when you allow that flow to come through you, that's when Mokuta Dashmaya, literally the essence of life itself, that expansive, creative, cosmic, feminine queendom is going to literally birth through you, but you've got to let down all of the, everything that you seem to think that you know about what you need to do and let it move through you and just pay attention to that breath moving through you consciously. That's how that essence of the kingdom happens and that's why that baby in the first 20 minutes of life you drop all of your preconceived notions of that you're just you're there with that essence and you're there and by you being in the essence of that child your essence is able to expand and open and it's just such a brilliant beautiful understanding that it wasn't about lacking anything it was literally like hey this is where you belong this is your natural state this is your home but you got to let go of everything you think about your life and everything you think about your home in order to activate it in your life it's just brilliant and it's so it's so freaking clear it's just clear i can i've seen people spend 20 pages trying to explain poor in spirit in theology and stuff and it's really nice stuff but if you're not coming from a translation that's accurate, you're sort of just kind of shooting something into the wind and seeing if you're going to hit something with your eyes closed. And uh, man, but if you look at it in the original language of Aramaic, it's just awesome. It's awesome. So you're saying ultimately, you got to be out of your mind. You got to be as a child. We have to live in the eternal forces. And if your carbon-based memory system, if your body's mind is screaming out and raging with its pain, its hostility, its fear, driven by the goals of all the stuff you want, it makes such a crass, coarse, uh, gross noise that the literal kingdom, that which you're designed to live in, is not available to you. It's shut down. It, it was called the still small voice, and, and the availability of it is nil while your body's mind, while your multi-generational data, database is screaming, raging, doing all the crazy stuff that uh, we've been taught to do in our culture. Mm. It is, too. It's crazy. I mean, it's it's insane, and it's the insanity that's the norm, unfortunately, today in so many ways, but I see the shift happening. Uh not with everybody, but with the woes who are willing to do it, it's happening. Mm. Yeah, it definitely takes the willingness to uh, to do the work. And that's why our focus uh, overall, the main focus of the body of work we've developed over the last 25, 30 years out of the Aramaic, is that of forgiveness. Because forgiveness goes in and collapses the noise from the mind. You know, oftentimes when people kind of, you know, it gets it gets a good laugh because one of my favorite tongue-in-cheek lines is, yeah, in order to function as a human being, you've got to be out of your mind. And the way you get out of your mind, and it's it's very much akin to what the world is called a near-death experience. The person who has what's called a near-death experience actually doesn't have a near-death experience. They have a near-life experience. Mm-hmm. If you go back to that um statement where, or that situation where there's a scribe who stands up to test Yeshua and he says, how do I inherit eternal life? And Yeshua says, how do you read it? And he quotes to him the first law, love, God, neighbor, and the Greeks translated as self. And Yeshua says to him, you spoke the truth. And then he tells him what question that answers. He says, you spoke the truth. Do this and you shall live. In other words, sir, who are asking about eternal life so that you can avoid dealing with what's going on in your life today, you don't have a life. You are already dead. You need to shut your mind up to have a taste, a near-life experience. The person who goes through what the world calls a near-death experience, I turn that around. The average person in our culture is dead. By the age of four, they're lost and locked in the insanity of the world. And... When we forgive, we collapse that 
we have a taste of our true human lives. And the person who has what's called a near-death experience, in fact, is having their life experience when the the carbon-based memory system, when this so-called body-mind unit shuts up, that is, it experiences clinical death, all of a sudden the body's mind is quiet. There's no noise from it. And this person has this awesome presence and this awesome experience of who they are. They're the absolute As you spoke about it, Dale, that first 20 minutes of life, the awesome presence of love. That's what we're designed to live as. And so the person who experiences clinical death and then is resuscitated usually or oftentimes brings back that experience of of life and in in so doing has the opportunity to bring that now into and introduce it to their body's mind and their lives change very dramatically when they make that introduction. Fortunately, we don't have to go through clinical death. All you have to do is step into the habit, and this is why we promote using the worksheet regularly, step into the habit of collapsing your mind's output regularly. Collapse it, collapse it, shut it up, shut it up, collapse it. It's got this hostile remark. It's got this nasty thing going on. It's got this belief. It's got that belief. It's got all the king's horses and all the king's men in there that are fragmenting them forgive and at first it's maybe only for a fraction of a second that it shuts up before something from the past something from carbon based memory rushes in to fill the gap but if you will do that consistently enough over a long enough period of time you will get that full blown near life experience and that's what happens with the with the breath process so we're actually uh, in Boca Raton Florida and on tomorrow we're looking at doing a Mind Shifters and Still Point Breathing Workshop here tomorrow, and we'll be doing it again next Saturday in uh, in Tampa. We head out of here uh, Saturday night and head to Tampa and start there with a seven-day workshop series, and then we'll be in, uh, Boca, or in Sarasota for a three-day conference we'll be doing, and uh, with some folks from a place called the Clear Mind Institute, and then we head to, uh, to uh, Palm Coast, just south of... Um, St. Augustine to do two back-to-back nine-day. Why is this happening to me again? Intensive. So lots of ways to get the experience of it, and that's where we want to go is into that direct, first-hand experience. And I I know of no better tool than Still Point ever that I've ever encountered. Just a, one second in Still Point for me. Uh, the first time that it ever happened to me was actually even before I even met you. I was already doing your still point process with friends of mine before I'd even seen you live. And uh, I remember just a second. I don't remember it like it's like this physical thing here, but I do remember when I came out and it was literally like all this stuff that I had rolled my sleeves up and tried to sludge out of my consciousness more moved in that one second than I had moved in probably four years at that point, it probably would have been more than that, even if I had been doing it for longer, but I had just sort of woke up maybe four years prior to that and more moved in a second from still point breathing than I had moved in four years. And I've heard people say 10 years and more of therapy. So, uh, and that, that's not a sales pitch. That's just the way it is because that's the natural state of our being. And that stuff's allowed to fall away when that happens. It's just, I could not possibly recommend still point more wholeheartedly. Uh, it's it's where it's at. <laughs> and, of course, that's living in the eternal forces when we live in the breath, as uh, as Tim pointed out. That, um, Absolutely, yeah. When, when we forgive and collapse and breathe, collapse the realities from the mind, we have an opportunity to step into a true human life, and that comes now forward into our worlds, and it's awesome. The still point is the place where the body's mind stops totally and everything in that instant shifts and changes. And so that's the, uh, the power of the breath and hand in hand with the forgiveness process. It just uh, opens such huge spaces. 
And with the mind shifters, too. When you put the mind shifters in there the night before, it's funny to see people resist that process. They're they're like, oh, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't. Or they're like, uh, I guess I wrote myself out. How much have you written? Oh, about a half page. I'm like, well, just keep going. Well, it's not making any sense. Just keep going. And it's after that that they – it's like the, the ego, that, that non-being self's like, all right, red flags up. Stop, 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 stop the process. Stop the process. And it's when you get past that and you keep going and you keep, you know, you keep that. It's the willingness that does it. You say it's the cosmic grease. You get past that veil, that layer, and that's when the magic starts happening. And the stuff that people write in that, in the mind shifters process is phenomenal. And then you come the next day for still point or whether it's the same day for still point, um, your subconscious is, is ready to go and it's stirring up pretty good. It's a pretty... Uh, it's a pretty amazing technique to begin the still point with the mind shifters, definitely. Definitely helps in the process. So then if we move on to the next beatitude in the Aramaic, the Abili, and that is where the classic translation says, or the historic is, blessed are those mourning their wrongs, for they will be comforted. And, you know, whenever I refer to that one, it's always, well, how many ever got really nice warm heart cockles from morning, sitting around morning, you're wrong. <laughs> produce a whole lot of results. But in Aramaic, from the Kaboris, it's been translated as, you who love truth, profess your errors and the errors of your society, and profess means to speak, that when we start to speak, we open parts of our minds. There's a an inhibitor system that we've talked about before in the way that the human mind works. And over 90% of brain chemistry is tied up in inhibiting brain cell firings. And the reason why Yeshua said the power of life and death is in your words is because your words either open those frequencies of death in you, create anti-inhibitors that allow those frequencies to file, or if your words are words of life, they open those frequencies of life, those things that support our being. So when you profess your errors, you get to open those things up, and that's when you can remove them. That's when they can be forgiven. And what he says the result of that will be, as the um, Kavuris uh, translates it, is you will be freed of mental stress. Mm. You know exactly. If you go to the medical doctors today, they'll tell you, you know, 95, some are saying 100% of the disease is caused by stress. Yes, you know exactly how to do that. You know, starting from the back end of that, the nitbayun at the end of that beatitude, um, if if the most perfect understanding I've ever seen of that is, is the uh, getting the stress you need workshop and learning about creating goals and canceling goals and that if you don't, either one, cancel it, or two, accomplish it, that the stress is still there. And it's amazing because that word nitbayun, that one of comforted, literally in Aramaic, it literally means that the stress is abolished, it's gone, freed of mental stress. And it also means seeing the face of that which you long for. Like imagine you have a parent and the child goes away, it's been six years, and they, the mother yearns for the child, yearns for the child, yearns for the child, and they still have that goal set, I would love to see my child. And all of a sudden they open the door one day and there's that child and she throws her arms around him. That's Nitbayun. And if you go to the front end of the Beatitude, the Abvile, um, we again have the EY sound at the end, which is similar to Ta. Now, the root of Abvile is the sound Abid. Abid, literally, what Abid means, the literal translation of that root there, is to not submit necessarily, but to recognize and acknowledge tr- the truth as it is, the truth of this moment, in other words. It means to submit to truth. Now, what's interesting is if I were to go to uh, Saudi Arabia today, and I were to go up to someone with really dark skin, and I looked at them and said, I bead, I would get my teeth punched in because it means what the N-word means for someone with dark skin here in America. Today, that's what it means. That's not means. That's not what it meant then. It was also a sect that we know of as the desert mothers and desert fathers that would actually congregate out in the desert um, outside of Jerusalem. They were mildly connected with the Essenes, and they would actually have these huge gatherings where they would get together and they would 
talk about and consider these massive issues in society at large, and they would literally do the forgiveness process in their own heart and literally go in and remove the root of their own suffering in relation to that which was happening on a larger scale throughout their society, understanding that if they were suffering, it's because there was something inside of themselves, and when they remove that root, it makes it that much easier for the others around them and society as a whole to remove that root. It literally, obviously, literally, it's feeling what is right now, the willingness to feel and the willingness to experience what is right now and it's funny that when you allow a person or your own inner experience to be exactly as it is if it's not real it falls away but and it's just like with a person if you resist what you can't stand about your boss trust me it's going to get worse it's going to get worse and it's going to break you down but if you actually can remove the root of that what is triggering inside of yourself and you remove that and you're allowing yourself to be okay with what's going on inside of you, it's like when you allow yourself to be who you are by nature, who you are not is allowed to fall away. And it's the same with the people in your life. You know, I started doing forgiveness work, and all of a sudden everybody in my life changed. And I couldn't figure it out. It's like, oh, my God, how is it I'm doing this and they're changing? It's like, hey, Dopey Dale, maybe it was never them in the first place. Maybe it was just your perception of them. And this is about having the willingness to – to have that clear perception and see things exactly as they are. How do you do that? You do that by, number one, remaining aware of the movement of rukha, of breath, through your system. And, of course, you need the second. You need the first to understand the second. You need the third to understand the second and the first. And there's just such an amazing richness um, richness in there. We're told to turn away from what's uncomfortable in our life, but like you say, the symptoms of healing look exactly like the symptoms of disease, exactly as it was going in. When it comes back out, it's the same way. And if you're not willing to feel it, guess what? You're not willing to heal it either. And we're told to turn away in a firm light, but unfortunately it's like you don't think about Barack Obama. Who are you not thinking about? Turning away doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's never worked. It's not going to start working tomorrow, even though it's never worked for a single moment in human history up to this point it's all of a sudden not going to just start changing but when you have the willingness to be with what is through the awareness of your breath allowing yourself to feel it you literally that stress that intensity and all that insanity that's going on in your mind is finally able to let go and it's us holding i had a beautiful private session with a woman yesterday who drove all the way down from maryland to have a session with me here in Asheville, and you know, I, I gave her the first three Beatitudes. I said, breathe, allow yourself to feel it. Number three, let it pass, let it flow. And she was like, but how, you know, I'm like, let it go. She's like, how do I let go? And I'm like, ah, that's the mind's trick. Here, put this pencil in your hand. Okay. And I'm like, tell me how you're going to let it go. She's like, I don't understand. I'm like, well, you were asking me about how to let go. I'm like, all right, then never mind telling me how to let go, just let go. And she turns her hand over. And I'm like, that's the mind's trick of how do I let go. you got to be willing to feel it, and you let it go. And that's, of course, step three. I'm sort of maybe jumping ahead of us, but step three is actually part of that forgiveness process of canceling it, the humility, not meekness as in being a doormat, but humility as in realizing humility actually comes from the word humus, which means of the earth. And I know I'm jumping ahead there, but uh, it's like when you're allowed, when you allow yourself to be with what is, what is not, or what is not real, you know what? It falls away by itself. Still points the probably, not probably, as far as what I've seen, it's the most profound example of that that I've ever seen in my life uh, because you're just focused on the breath. And you're just focused on the breath. And you're just focused on the breath. And when you focus on Ruka completely, All that stuff's allowed to fall away. Sometimes it's a second, sometimes it's a few minutes, but uh, your life changes in the process. Well, and we're also blessed today that we have, I think, perhaps a deeper understanding of the physics of the whole game. And when you recognize that there are no pictures, anything that you see in pictures does not resemble what's actually out there in the world. You know, when when someone looks at what they call a body, they're looking at an image in their brain generated by their brain interior to them and unique to them. So that's why 
10 different people can look at a particular person, someone's joyous, someone's unhappy, someone's raging, someone's grief-stricken, each one of them creating pictures, thinking that their feelings come from the person that's out there, but if you could see the person who was out there, you'd see this whirring mass of electrons, protons, neutrons, and light. You would not see a body. The body is made up of whatever that person's energy resonates in you. And so when you make pictures that are disturbing to you, the reason why the power of forgiveness is so awesome and the power of the breath is so awesome is because when you collapse those pictures and there is the breath and or the love present, then everything that's in you that you've been making those pictures out of you automatically and spontaneously begins to dissolve. And, of course, that's why everybody around you changes because everybody that you think that you're looking at around you isn't around you. What's out there, if you could see what was actually there, is this whirring mass of electrons, protons, neutrons, and light, and it's a digital or an energetic experience. And what we've been taught to do is to create pictures in our minds out of the energies in us and pretend that those energies in us are about somebody outside of us, and that's the the game of projection, and that when you forgive, you collapse those projections, and all of a sudden, the game changes. It's a whole different process. And that's where that next beatitude, I think, spontaneously comes in, in the uh, Kaboras, that um, word uh, humility, in in the uh, Kaboras is translated as the mental quality of perceiving and cooperating with the good desires of others and that there'll be a result in that is that is you'll, you'll gain the earth if you do that. And so that humility being that quality of I look for only the highest and best in another and if they resonate something less than me, I forgive it and remove it. And by doing that, I'll move forward in my experience of my life. Mm. Um, you know it's amazing in, in the Aramaic it doesn't say inherit the earth it says actually that you realize that you are of the earth isn't that interesting just like in John 3.16 it doesn't say you inherit eternal life it says you realize you are eternal life uh, c- could I ask Tim if he could read the uh, JM's take on the second beatitude because I love that I love he- having that quality in there that was really beautiful with the first so the first one is now is the ripe time make your home in the breathing unity the fertile soil of the queendom will birth your clear guidance Mm. and the second one is restored are they who allow their inner pain to surface they shall touch the place where love carries them to greater wholeness (laughs) I love it man that's not a theological promise that's like That's awesome. Thank you. And and then moving into the third one, which you've already alluded to, this next um, beatitude reads, Having made soft what was rigid within, a new ripeness shall bring renewed inspiration, and confident strength will flow through them. Mm. (laughs) That's awesome. That's great. Thank you very much for doing that. Oh, thank you. Mm. Awesome. So so we've gone through three of the Beatitudes now. The first one in Aramaic, the, the promise is a, that you'll have a heavenly estate. The second one is you'll be freed of mental stress. The third one is you'll gain the earth or you'll move forward in your world and in your life. So the next Beatitude, uh, seeing as how we're down to about three minutes, we should probably just put this one on hold and plan for Aramaic Friday next week to get into the the next beatitude, which is traditionally or historically interpreted as blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. And you watch people with the fear-based mindset who talk about their righteous anger and how they are righteous in their judgment and such. And suffice to say that Yeshua had a whole different thing in mind than justifying people being able to rage at somebody else because there was something wrong with somebody else. So, so what I'd like to do at this point with just a couple of minutes left is, Dale, uh, tell us about your website and events you've got going on. Tim, perhaps you could tell us about the support group uh, up there in Woodstock. Um, my Well, my website is DaleAllenHoffman.com. 
A-L-L-E-N is the spelling of my middle name. And the way I ex- explain it to people, if you just go to Google and write Dale Aramaic um, pages, the stuff will pop up, and my website will be right at the top. Um, you can also go to AramaicHealingCircle.com. It forwards to the same site. Um, <clears throat> we're actually, you know, we I, I had spent a lot of last year at home quietly, and this year we're, we're scheduling events. We've got them moving across Canada, literally from Nova Scotia across to Vancouver, um, all over the Pacific Northwest, the Midwest, um, New England, the you know the uh, up and down the East Coast. We're just scheduling like crazy right now, all over Texas. Um, with in the next few weeks, though, um, I have some events I'm doing in Raleigh. One that uh, it's actually a home gathering in conjunction with the larger events I've, I've been doing, gatherings in people's homes that have been absolutely beautiful, some something more intimate. And what we do in Raleigh is we're going to be sitting with a crystal bowl and um, doing it's going to be less teaching and actually doing Aramaic intonation, which is intoning the sounds of Wun Rav Ma, and we sit around a crystal bowl doing that off and on for a couple of hours. I integrate Aramaic prayers, a little bit of teaching. It's a very experiential, beautiful process. And then on um, Saturday morning. Uh, it, it's the 30th and 31st. You can get the information on my website on Saturday morning on the 31st in Raleigh. I'm teaching what I call an etheric development workshop, which is something I've been doing for over 20 years before I even found the Aramaic. I was working with guys like Stuart Wilde and different people. Of One, I didn't teach it for a long time because it seemed a little like bells and whistles to me, and lately it's become so integrated in my life. Things like reading your energy field, how to tighten the energy, um, Things, of course, like how to use the breath to to let go of things like leaning in your life where you're sort of yearning to get some sort of a reaction from other people. Talking about forgiveness in real time, um, like right there in the process when you're standing in front of the person. It's something that uh, – it's the first time I've ever done that, the etheric development workshop. And it's all based right around those Aramaic teachings of Yeshua. That's the 30th and 31st of March. And then I met um, – Divine Science Church of the Healing Tri- Christ in Georgetown, Washington, D.C., on the 14th, I think it is, Saturday the 14th um, of March. And then we've got tons of events from May, actually the end of April, all the way through the end of the year that we haven't even put up on the website yet. But just in the next few weeks, that's the events I've got coming. Sorry, I took a lot of time to do that. but <laughs> Cool. Well, we're delighted to have you on our team and to be on yours. And the, the blessing and opportunity to share the plan with you, Dr. Tim. You want to tell us about uh, your support group at the new Unity Center in um, in Woodstock? We have it in Woodstock, Illinois, and it's on Tuesday evenings. We run from 6:30 to 9, and um, it's it's open to anyone. It's um, sponsored by Unity Church, but many of the people who come there are not Unity members. And we watch an hour of one of Dr. Rice's videos, and then we discuss and we. Occasionally throw in something from Yayam, like the Beatitudes DVD. We did that a couple of years ago. And um, come on, come all. You can find out about it on unitywoodstock.org or on my website, cnhcounseling.com. And there are several uh, audios and things that you can watch on uh, on Dr. Tim's website. And, of course, the information is also on www.whyagain.com. Please bring a stranger to the show tomorrow, and next Friday, once again, we'll celebrate Aramaic Fridays, and uh, we'll go into the next of the Beatitudes. So create the best year yet of your eternal life. Thanks for coming and joining us. Blessings. Thank you for listening to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice and his wife, Jeannie, who present the internal Aramaic process of forgiveness. Michael and Jeannie are here every Monday through Friday on Earth Angels Radio. For more on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.yagain.com. That's www.whyagain.com.